Hi, I'm Percy Sutton, a lawyer, a businessman, and chairman emeritus, founder of Inner City Broadcasting Corporation. Welcome, my brothers and sisters, to Culture Share. Enjoy. When did you acquire the radio stations WBLS and WLIB? I hope you enjoyed your trip through uh, Harlem and getting here, and I thank you very much for coming. With regard to WLIB and WBLS, I acquired WLIB in 1972, and WLIB FM was on the air only a couple of hours a day, and we converted that to WBLS FM uh, in the following year. So we acquired the first stations in 1972 and 1973. Why were Caribbeans as important in terms of um, the programming on, um, on WLIB? The reason we elected to program to the uh, Caribbean community in New York City on WLIB is simply because we thought it was needed. And there were other people programming to a variety of other areas, so we set aside a period of day to program to the West Indian community, as we called it at that time, now called the Caribbean community. Dr. Stanislaus, Grenada Ambassador-at-Large, said he supported your bid for public office. Could you elaborate on this part of your life? Dr. Stanislaus, how wonderful a man he is. Dr. Stanislaus uh, was and still is a good friend. In 19, oh, I guess in my first bid for public office, for the assembly, he was there to help me. And then when I ran for borough president, he was there to help me. When I ran for mayor, he was there to help me. Invaluable assistance he gave to me. Let me give you some background with regard to my progress in politics and who the people were who gave me my initial help and continued to give me help through the years. The West Indian or Caribbean community was greatly valuable to me, highly valuable to me for it was Mrs. Schultz, who is working now in my office and has been with me for 44 years, who gathered together the first persons, predominantly persons from the Caribbean area, to work with me back in 1953 when I began preparing to run for public office. And for 11 consecutive years, the majority, overwhelming majority of persons who helped me in politics were persons of West Indian or Caribbean origin. Now, this is important also to apply to my job, which was as a lawyer. Because Southerners, and I'm from Texas, Southerners saw very few lawyers who were accomplished and able to accomplish things in court. They were not kindly disposed to go to black lawyers in New York City. But persons from the West Indies understood well the value of black lawyers because they'd seen black lawyers. Their families had seen black lawyers in the West Indies. So when they came to New York, it was no great effort for them to hire a black lawyer, whereas for Southerners, it was a great effort. And the majority of my practice, the overwhelming majority, maybe 80% of my practice, my law practice came from the Caribbean community here in New York City. And so it was in politics as well. I reaffirmed that. What is very interesting is that when I came to New York, I got all this support from the Caribbean community. But when I was growing up, I only got to know one person, one person of the thousands of people that I came in contact with one person who came from the West Indian area, the Caribbean community. That person was a photographer, a man who came down to Texas uh, as a part of a tour that he made. And how did we know? He happened to come from Barbados. And that man came only once a year and stayed about three weeks and then moved on to other cities, taking photographs, and then he'd send the photographs back of school children, classes, graduation ceremonies, and things of that nature. So isn't it interesting that I got to know in my childhood only one person from the Caribbean, and yet when I got to New York, the predominant support that I've gotten, the predominant relations that I have are with persons from the Caribbean area. 
What year did you bless New York with your presence? I came to New York out of the military uh, in 1940. Well, I should tell you, my first visit to New York, of course, was in my childhood. Uh, my father and my brother brought me here. My sister was ill in New Jersey. Uh, um, she was a medical doctor practicing in Montclair, New Jersey, and she lost her mind in childbirth. We didn't know that she'd lost her mind at the time we came here, but I was four years of age in my first visit to New York. And then my father and mother would bring me here on other occasions. I fell in love with New York by watching a program called Grand Central Station, the crossroads of a million lives. And you could hear the roar of the engine and the train coming in, the whistle and all those dramatic things. But I fell in love with New York a long, long time ago. And when I was in the military, I came here to get into the military to apply because I, they, they wouldn't let me in in Texas. I wanted to be a pilot. And they wouldn't let me in in Texas. And I had learned to fly. And I was a stunt pilot, jumping out of planes, flying planes on the, in ridiculous manner, uh, and yet they wouldn't let me join the Air Force. So stupid me, I thought that things were different in New York. I could come here and join the Air Force. But of course I couldn't. But that was my introduction to New York as an adult in the year 1939. When did you first hear Calypso? With regard to Caribbean music, I don't remember the first year I ever heard uh, Caribbean music, Calypso, or any other music. Uh, I remember, however, it was in the period that I was in the military. There were a number of people that I got to know in the military who were from various islands, and I, I had uh, they had records and things, they played them then. But the first time, I don't remember. Okay, could, could you elaborate on, on around a year when um, you, your experience in the military when you encountered other um, um, uh, blacks from the Caribbean? In the years 1940, I went into the military in the year 1941, the latter part of 1941, in December of 1941. I went in as a uh, cadet in training, and there was one of the cadets who was killed in combat who was from the Virgin Islands, and there was another one who was there who was a mechanic, a matter of fact, head of the mechanics, who was from Jamaica, and so I came in contact, and I do remember that both of them played music coming from the Caribbean area. What, if any, relationship to French Spanish or English speaking Caribbeans do you have? Since coming to New York, I've had many relationships with people from Haiti, French speaking people, uh, people from Puerto Rico, Spanish speaking people, English speaking people from Jamaica, uh, from Trinidad, from Barbados, uh, from St. Kitts, St. Nevis. Uh, oh, just uh, you take me through the uh, Caribbean area, and I know someone from each of those islands. And all of them, the marvelous thing that I can report to uh, you is that all of the persons that I know from the Caribbean areas have been good friends to me. They have supported me through the years. I hope that I've returned that good faith and that good support to them. I believe that I have. What impact did Marcus Garvey, Herbert Harrison, W.E.B. Du Bois have on your life? I am a Pan-Africanist and my father was a Garveyite uh, and the only contact he had with Mr. Garvey was that which he read because uh, on just only on occasion in the summertime would he come to New York. My father was an educator and a businessman and all of his four, 15 children uh, 12 of us lived to maturity. All of us were at one time or another allowed to travel with him to a variety of places, including Africa. Unfortunately, we never traveled to the Caribbean area during that period of time. My father gave me access to thoughts and readings with regard to Mr. Garvey and 
With regard to Dr. Du Bois, whose background, whose family background is from the Caribbean, I, I, is in the Caribbean, uh, I got to know him personally, uh, so, and I had a chance to work with him over the years, for a few years, uh, before he went to Ghana to live and to there die. So I've had a chance to know many, many intellectuals and others from the Caribbean area over the years. I would tell you that the majority of people that I consider friends just happen to be from the Caribbean area. And the majority of knowledge which I have come into possession of over the years were perhaps, and I believe this to be true, uh, given to me, the knowledge, the information, the intellect, came in the majority from persons of West Indian or Caribbean origin. You see, I keep saying West Indian because I grew up with that term, West Indian. And I know it's more proper to say Caribbean today. Do you recall any Caribbean person that ever influenced your life at any time? Of the many people who have had dramatic influence on my life, I would suppose that the person who has had, has been most impactful is a lady called Sylvia Schultz, who's in the next room here. Mrs. Schultz came to me when I began the practice of law. She taught me, virtually, how to practice law. She gathered for me the clients to practice with. I built a law practice and a political structure on the basis of the friends that Mrs. Schultz, Sylvia Schultz, this lady whose family comes from Barbados. So the most impactful person on my life has been Sylvia Schultz. I call her Mrs. Schultz all of the time. Even when my wife and I go on vacation with Mrs. Schultz and her husband, Philip, I still call, I call Philip, Philip, but I call Mrs. Schultz. Mrs. Schultz. My wife calls her by the first name, but I don't. And the reason that is, is because I was trained as a youngster to address everybody as Mr. and Mrs. I do that to this day. Nobody do I call by their first name except someone I'm a long-time friend from my childhood. And But if anybody else is present, I'll call them Mr. or Mrs. And I will not call them by their first name. But back to this issue of who has both been the most impactful upon my life. And that person is Mrs. Sylvia Schultz. During the civil rights era, do you recall by name any Caribbean people in the struggle? During the civil rights struggle, there were many persons from the Caribbean area involved in the civil rights struggle. One of them, uh, until his death, I had often contacts with him uh, he's known as Stokely Carmichael. Stokely Carmichael and I were for a day or two together in Parchment Penitentiary, both of us in the struggle in 1961 to be involved in changing America. So uh, I've known many people from the Caribbean area who are involved, but the person who comes to instant attention is Stokely Carmichael. Could you uh, just reflect on um the type of person you would call him to be? How do I remember Stokely Carmichael? And I, I want to, because there are a lot of people who won't know him by his African name, so I call him Stokely Carmichael. Uh, Stokely Carmichael I met when he was a very young man. I met him around the same time I met Reverend Jackson. They were both about 19 years of age when I met them. Stokely Carmichael was a handsome, strong, energetic, articulate, and forcefully articulate person who, at first blush, I, accustomed to hearing nationalists speak on 125th Street, was not overly impressed by him at first blush. The second time I heard him speak was after I'd seen him do some organizing and talking to people so when I heard him speak the next time, I looked at him differently and I appreciated how really forceful he was and that's the reason I describe him as a 
forceful and articulate person. Another person who's had great influence upon my life, as a matter of fact, who's kept me alive a number of years until the retirement a few years ago, was Dr. Muriel Petioni, whose family, whose father was a medical doctor as well, and Dr. Petioni, and he had come from Trinidad. Dr. Petioni is still alive, still going well, uh, refuses to be my doctor now, went and retired and heard me like that. But Dr. Petioni is uh, greatly influential here in New York City in politics, in medicine, in science, and in community activity. A remarkable person. To see her in her 80th year, and 81st year, walking along 125th Street like she's a scooter. Uh, just scooting along 125th Street is a sight to behold. But to know her brain and her sensitivity and her warmth is a greater thing to behold. Do you see WLIB, especially with all the links that, are, that they make to different islands and to Africa as a bridge to Africans in the diaspora, and why? For many years, WLIB was, despite anything we could do, for more than 25 years, WLIB was a only daytime station. And we tried to cram into it as much information as possible, as much concern as possible, for people from the Caribbean and the African nations, Caribbean nations and African nations. It was not an easy thing to do. And as well, I should tell you, uh, that for a period of time, our audience had not gained sufficiently from the Caribbean community. And there was some complaint about that from the non-Caribbean community. We don't get those complaints anymore. Uh, we continued programming and increased our coverage of the Caribbean community and increased our coverage of the African nations here in the United States and, and Africa with regard to what they are, and then began visiting those other countries, countries in the, connecting with their radio stations, actually physically taking our microphones into in, into the West Indies states, to the Caribbean nations, talking with the people there, talking with high public officials, and then moving, as I said, to talk with the radio stations there, uh, using some of their music, sharing our programming with them uh, from nation to nation, island to island. And now, uh, many people refer to WLIB is the West Indian station, the Caribbean station, when in fact it's a station for everyone of African descent, primarily. Caribbeans are both African heritage and European heritage. Which of these do you relate to most? Do you intend to continue the relationship with Caribbeans in the future, and why? A question of, uh, was asked of me, do I intend to continue the relationships with persons from the Caribbean area? And the question also with that was, uh, who do you relate to, persons of European descent or African descent? I don't know anybody from, of European descent. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, the people that I know are of African descent, um, who are in the uh, Caribbean area. Uh, I do intend to continue to relate to them. It's to my advantage to continue to relate to them not commercially, but because it, I want to get along with my wife. And she is the most beautiful lady, and I've been married to her for 55 years now. And she is from the Caribbean area, her family is, uh, and I want to get along with her. But I say that in a jesting manner, but frankly, I like Mrs. Schultz. I like Beatrice Sutton. I like the people that I know from the Caribbean area, and I can't imagine myself being able to live without them. You may know that I'm now attempting, and in progress rather, to put a satellite, a telephone and television satellite, over the entire continent of Africa. And the reason I'm doing it is because I've worked in Africa, in on many nations on the continent there, and I've seen the great difficulty that you have in communicating even with a person across the city because of the absence of telephones. Only 3% of all of the people who are in business 
or in residences have telephones in the entire continent of Africa. So, and no continent, no nation can develop to maturity, to competitive maturity, if they cannot communicate without the secure infrastructure of telecommunications. Now, with regard to the community of the West Indies or the Caribbean area, I don't have any businesses out there. My contact with them is to visit and to be in touch with them by our radio stations and to attend the fairs given by them. I attend many, many fairs here and just out of warmth, affection and appreciation for their contribution to my life. I attend dinners and weddings and things of persons who are from the West Indian or Caribbean community. Please understand that when I continue to say West Indian, I say it because I grew up with that term and it is not a, it is not a derogatory term. It is just that words change, names change as we evolve. Because uh, interesting enough, uh, when I was growing up, the Virgin Islands was a part of, was the West Indies as far as we were concerned. Uh, both American and the British Virgin Islands. Uh, I wouldn't think of Bermuda so close as it is to, uh, uh, to Florida and to America. I, I never thought of it as West Indian or Caribbean. I thought it was, well, I knew where it was, but I thought of it as being a part of America. Um, could you just touch a little bit on, on um, Malcolm X, um, your relationship with Malcolm X, uh, knowing that Malcolm X's parents are yeah, well, from Grenada? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When the question is asked, uh, could I touch upon my relations with Minister Malcolm X, whose attorney I was, and whose family I've represented since his death, both his wife, who is now deceased, and his children now. And incidentally, you're well aware that Minister Malcolm's parents came from the Caribbean area in a little place called Grenada that I love very much and have visited very often. Minister Malcolm gave me great support when I was running for public office. For 11 consecutive years, I'd either run or sponsor someone else to run for the state assembly or some other office here in Harlem. And for 11 consecutive years, the people in their good judgment rejected me, rejected me, and rejected me. Not only rejected me, but rejected everyone that I supported. But then, with the support of Minister Malcolm, who had by that time been pushed out of the Nation of Islam, or the so-called Black Muslims at that time, who came with me, helped, brought people to me, and helped me get elected to the assembly, and rode with me to the assembly. The assembly is at is a state, we have the assembly and the senate, state senate. These are legislative offices representing the state of New York. The place or the capital where they preside is in Albany, New York, roughly 135 miles from New York City. On the day that I was elected, I'm sorry, the day I was to be sworn in, in the year 1965, having been elected through Malcolm's help in 1964, Minister Malcolm rode with me on the bus, sitting next to a white, Episcopalian. When we got to Albany, police were everywhere because some man called Minister Percy Sutton was bringing that outrageous man, as he was described, that frightening man, Minister Malcolm. I want you to know, while the police were er everywhere as we arrived in the morning, by the time evening came, there were people, right-wing people, legislators bringing their children to take a picture with Minister Malcolm and I was forgotten. The point is 
It's funny how celebrities can impress people and then enfold them as was done in that instance. As you know, a man from the Caribbean area uh, is Harry Belafonte, and Sidney Poitier is another. I have known them for many, many years. As a matter of fact, very recently, in a march here in New York City, with regard to police action that we were opposing, who was there? There was my old friend, Harry Belafonte. I admire him greatly because he's been constantly involved in the civil rights movement. Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm was my associate when I was in the State Assembly in the years 1965 and 1966. Shirley came in 1966. I had the pleasure, after getting to know her and admiring her, to be the person who put her in nomination when she ran for the presidency of the United States. I also remember raising for her the first $25,000 for her presidential candidacy. I admired her. She's tough, elegant speaker, and eloquent. And we used to ride up to Albany together. And I learned a lot from her. Shirley Chisholm, from Barbados, family from Barbados in the Caribbean, making a name for herself here in America, and in the process, helping all of us to be better Americans from wherever we come. It was Sylvia Schultz who typed up all of the documents to go into bankruptcy court to buy the Apollo Theater when it was closed down my family and I went and bought the Apollo Theater for a quarter of a million dollars and with help from the state and from a bank and from inner city broadcasting corporation, six million dollars from inner city broadcasting corporation, we took the Apollo Theater. We owned it from 1980 until 1992. We took it and made it the economic engine of 125th Street. A man by the name of Herbert Greer, a man by the name of Chaka, Chaka, a man, lady by the name of Sylvia Schultz, were all key to my being able to buy the Apollo Theater and to resurrect it, to make it what it is now, the economic engine of 125th Street. For if there had been no Apollo Theater, for when the Apollo Theater was closed down and it lying in its grave, at 253 West 125th Street here in Harlem. Every other store on 125th Street was closed. And now, here as I speak to you, I pay, I pay $49 a square foot for this space on 125th Street, where my company and its new chairman, Pierre Sutton, my son, they pay only $24 a square foot for the top two floors of that magnificent building at number three Park Avenue at 34th Street. So the Apollo Theater was helped in its reconstruction by persons from the Caribbean area, predominantly in that array of people was Mrs. Sylvia Schultz and Harold Greer. Those two people were the greatest help to me. And both of them and their families come, or their families come from the Caribbean area.